Um, good evening, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Benjamin Greenlay. We're up here with me is Michael Lung, and our group mates, George Baxter, Elwin Ha, and Matthew Haynes are manning our booth. And we developed Paris, the pass fade inexpensive or anti-reflective solution. So we'd like to thank Dr. Tsui from here at the University of Waterloo, as well as Drs. Christensen, Drs. Moltensen, and Alex Christensen from the Danish Techn Technical University. So to start off, what is an anti-reflective coating? Well, an anti-reflective coating is any coating you can apply to an optical surface, which will reduce the reflection of any incoming light. So I'll talk to you about the current technologies that are available on the market currently. There's currently three simple, uh, three different procedures that are available. The first one is the single layer anti-reflective coating. The second one is an alternating refractive index. And the third one is the graduated uh, refractive index, or GRIN. So the single refractive index system is good for single wavelength and single angles. It's, uh, it's very good for uses such as in lasers and other things like that. Unfortunately, outside of the wavelength which it was designed for, the reflection is quite high. And also, it's very angle sensitive, as outside of the angle, like incident angle of zero, the reflection also gets quite high. Now, the current industry standard for doing anti-reflective coatings is this alternating refractive indices. This is what would be used in glasses, cameras, and other higher end products. Fortunately, this is a very expensive process as it uses chemical vapor deposition and also requires a lot of precision as each of these layers need to be built to specific thickness to obtain the, uh, to obtain the destructive interference pattern that is required to maximize the transmission. The third system is the gradient refractive index. This is more of a theoretical system as if it was possible to obtain materials that are perfectly linear from the first refractive index to the second one, then, then in theory you would obtain 100% transmission. Unfortunately, these materials do not exist and so the industry has gone about by estimating these with different materials and doing multiple layers, stepping it up one by one. Now obviously, the more steps you put, the better it is but you've created more and more processes and it is a lot more expensive. So the inspiration for our project came from two different materials. The first is a nanostructured substrate and the second is a mesopore silica nanoparticles we use to coat the substrate. So first, the mesopore silica nanoparticles. So this is, comes from the first type of consumer product that's available now, the single layer coating. So the mesopore silica is tuned by the various, various thickness of the layer itself to work for a specific wavelength. So on its own, it is an anti-reflective coating. However, it's, it is uh, not usable for a wide range of wavelengths. So mesopore silica is essentially kind of like a glass, a, ho a hollow glass foam, where we can add different ratios of binder solution to increase the um, refractive index. So it's therefore, the refractive index is tunable between mesopore silica itself at 1.12 and whatever the substrate is at closer to 1.5. Our other inspiration came from anti-reflective uh, nanostructures. So these nanostructures are sub-wavelength in size, so therefore they don't reflect light in the traditional sense. So because they're sub-wavelength, what it essentially does is it provides the perfect gradient refractive between whatever the refractive index of the surrounding media is and the substrate itself. So this removes the interface. Um, theoretically, these are, as we found in practice, these structures can therefore be very inexpensive to produce, as we can take our silicon master mold where we produce the structures and quickly injection mold and transfer this pattern to any sample we want to work with. And so these structures are also randomly distributed nanostructures. So in a given area where, weight, where light may hit the sample itself, there's a whole series of different size nanostructures, so it's no longer wavelength specific and works as a broad wavelength anti-reflective surface. However, the problem is these are still nanostructures. So if you touch these nanostructures, you've de therefore destroyed your surface and destroyed your anti-reflective property. So we aim to improve this. So I'll tell you about our solution. Our solution is a combination of basically both of the two ideas together to get the advantages of both solutions while mitigating the disadvantages. So over here you can see the substrate has the nanostructures in them and above it we've coated the substrate with the mesopore silica. Mesopore silica acts as a protective layer to protect the nanostructures and also fills the gaps in between the structures to help so that when there is contact or touching it would not destroy the structures beneath it. Uh, some of the advantages of this is that it's a very inexpensive solution. Again, the, meso, uh, the nanostructures are patterned on through very simple processes, and the mesopore silica similarly is done through, uh, through inexpensive solutions. 
Some of the disadvantages is that it's still quite a uh, multi-process. It requires two steps as opposed to one. And it's, an in, an it's a very expensive initial mold to do. But however, once you have the mold, you are able to do multiple samples out of it. Uh, some of the applications that we're thinking for this are in camera lenses, optical glasses, or, and screens such as laptops and mobile phones, which currently do not have any anti-reflective coatings, and perhaps even into the other higher-end markets such as cameras and telescopes. So now down to the fabrication of our nanostructures. So starting, by inter starting for anti-reflective coating, all is built up for the nanostructures themselves. So these nanostructures are fabricated using an unmasked reactive ion etching process which will naturally, with the right gas conditions, form the nanostructures on a silicon substrate. Following this, we gave it a quick anti-stiction coating before moving on to our, the main part of our project, which was pattern transfer. So for the samples you'll see later in our results, they're all done by UV curing, which is one of the easiest ways to transfer the pattern. So in A1, you see our black silicon master mold. Down in A3, what we've done is we've poured some UV curable substrate onto our master mold. In A4, it's planarized and then exposed to the UV light. And then finally, due to the anti-stiction coating, the samples, once fully cured, will snap apart, leaving our sample on the, our planarized surface. Following the production of the nanostructures themselves, we're now going to deposit the mesopore silica. Ideally, in, sort of at, in mass production, we'd be spray coating the samples. But in the laboratory, we use dip coating to, to ensure precise film thicknesses. So a dip coating, procedure, or dip coating solution is made up of two parts. One is the binder solution, which is made up of isopropanol, tetraethyl orthosilicate, and a little bit of hydrochloric acid. On the other hand, we have the mesopore silica, which came suspended in an isopropanol solution. As for dip coating itself, dip coating, you, dip, you move the sample into the dip coater, and then you pull it out at a precise speed, which allows you to have uniform pull speed, gives you uniform sample thicknesses. So now we'll move on to validation and verification of our samples. So we've, uh, we started with four different substrates that we wish to test, uh, Ormacomp, Norland Optical Adhesive, and Polycarbonate and PMMA. And to ensure that we meet all of our requirements, we've tested, under four different, we've tested four different samples, one of the blank untreated substrate, one with the nanostructures applied onto them, one with the mesoporous silica th thin film and one with the combined solution of them together. Now, the consumer requirements that we were faced with is that we're trying to make an anti-reflective coating and therefore we are trying to decrease the reflection. And so a piece of a normal piece of untreated glass would reflect about 10% of the light. So therefore our primary requirement was to just improve upon that and also to do it over a wide variety of angles up to 45 degrees. And then as we go into the secondary tertiary requirements, we are trying to decrease that reflection down to zero. Uh, secondly is to make sure that we are able to contact, have contact with our, with our substrate and not destroy the nanostructures that are placed upon it. And so we, are, we went through minimal contact, moderate contact, and intensive contact for it. And our third requirement that we went through is for mass production. We want to make a solution that is inexpensive and that can be mass producible. So we're looking at things, so UV curable polymer, which was easy to do, but we want something that is easier to mass produce, such as uh, through injection molding and hot embossing. So to characterize our samples, we use primarily four different methods. Uh, the first one is through scanning electron microscope. This is to ensure that the patterns have been transferred successfully onto our samples and to also look at the uniformity of our mesopore silica thin film. Second one is optical test. We are measuring transmission, as that is the primary requirement that, uh, and our primary goal. And the third one is to measure the hardness or the durability of our sample, both by scratch testing and the hardness testing using the Mohs hardness test and the Berkovich nano indenter. And the trade-offs that we're looking at are between scratch trade-offs and optical quality, the cost of a polymer, and the cost of the curing process, and the cost of the mesopore silica versus the optical quality. So now we finally arrive at our results. So first of all, I'm going to start by explaining the mesopore silica layer. So as you see here in the SCM image, we have managed through, pull, through dip coating to produce a uniform film thickness. So there's two really important uh, components to the mesopore, mesopore silica film. The first is the binder ratio, as increasing the amount of binder produces a harder substrate, but also a more reflective substrate. And the other important point is the pull speed. 
higher pull speeds have a, it results in a thicker film. And therefore, it, especially for single layer mesoporous silico, mesoporous silico films, this in, chooses which wavelength you want to have sort of the maximum transmission at. So starting here, we're working with eight centimeters per minute pull speeds. So you, as you expect, the 10% binder is the most anti-reflective and down from there. So as you see in our samples themselves, 10%, once again, is the most anti-reflective sample. Moving forward with sort of 12 centimeters per minute pulse speeds, you see that one of our best samples here is the 35% binder, has a very high anti-reflection across all wavelengths, approaching above 99% at, at low wavelengths, at below 45, or 450 nanometers. So this is, once again, you can see in our sample itself, 35% here is the most anti-reflective. And finally, we tried one more pulse speed at 240 centimeters, or 24 centimeters per minute. So here, at such a thick film, the, the optimized um, wavelength is m more like, likely in the UV or the IR range. So therefore, it's not optimized for vis visual reflection. So therefore, you see much more reflection in our samples themselves. Moving forward, so our best sample was 35%. So we also were interested in the angle response. So we tested 0 degrees, 15 degrees, 30 degrees, and 45 degrees. So at 0, 15, and 30 degrees, the samples showed only about a 1% reflection variation, whereas the 45 degrees is such a harsh angle, had an increased reflection. But it was still all four, even at 45 degrees, was a huge improvement over our glass substrate. Also, so finally for the nano indentation, this is only qualitative data due to sort of substrate effects along with this process. However, you see that 60% has a much higher hardness than the 35 and the 10% as well as the Young's modulus to be calculated. Once again, 60% is greater than 35 and the 10%. The next st step of this process was with the nanostructures. So what we have here is an SEM image showing that our positive nanostructure mold was successfully transferred to create these negative structures you see here in our sample. Either way, it's theoretical that both the positive and the negative impression should have about the same anti-reflective properties. So our NOA samples here, so from first um, impression, the results are much lower than you would expect. What this is attributes to is sort of scattering in the nanostructures themselves as they will naturally scatter and therefore absorb light. So this represents the worst case scenario. But either way, for most of the wavelength, you do see that it's increased transmission in our nanostructured samples. It's also important to note that at low wavelengths, uh, we used UV curable polymers. So therefore, it has lower transmission because our polymer is absorbing these low wavelengths. All right, so now we moved on to combining both the nanostructures and the mesoporosilicas together. And as you can see, we've used two different UV curable polymers, the NOA61 and the NOA68. And we've ex we experienced that the NOA61 has a higher transmission than the NOA68. So moving on forward, we, we, we used that substrate and we characterized it over different angles. And as we can see over here, over again, over 0, 15 degrees and 30 degrees, the transmission has not changed very much. And at, 35 deg at 45 degrees, sorry, the transmission decreases slightly. But again, still a lot better than the glass, than the glass untreated samples. Now you can see this is a picture comparing the untreated glass sample compared to our sample with a 35% binder pulled at 120 millimeters per minute with the nanostructures impregnated into them. Now this is just, oh, sorry, this is the, uh, the test of our handling requirements. So we, we wanted to make sure that these structures are still good after handling. And so we tested it by wiping them off with Kim wipes and also with different with water and a solvent isopropanol. Again, we see slight decreases in transmission, but nothing too significant. So moving on, this is the summary of all of our results. You can see that uh, the gray line is the blank glass substrate, and the black line is that of the UV curable polymer. And then the blue line with the nanostructures, the red one with the mesopore silica. And it's only by combining both of these solutions together that we are able to maximize transmission up to 98% over most of the visible wavelengths. So finally, this leaves room for some future work on our project. So as I mentioned, we are using the negative impressions of the structures to get the results we have here. We're also interested in testing sort of the positive relief just to ensure that both of these are equal. Maybe perhaps the positive might have a better or anti-reflective properties. Um, also, we only managed to work with the, the UV curable substrates. And we have started some work on injection molding, but we haven't produced any results yet. But we're interested in finalizing the results for the injection molding as also moving on sort of hot embossing of our sample. And we also Along the same lines, we'd like to move from dip coating our samples to spray coating the MPS, just for pure mass production. 
Uh, thank you for listening. If you have any questions. No question. <laughs> So we did measure the scratch resistance. The problem was we measured of the just the MPS film, and we think we're having adhesion problems between the film and the substrate itself. So given any of the Mohs hardness, we weren't able to get a quantitative result from that. So obviously the scratch resistance can be further optimized. We only tried several uh, different binder ratios, but we can try different uh, mesopore silica. So like mesopore silica is offered in a range of various sizes and porosity. And so these are two other alternatives that could be explored. However, we just bought these commercially and therefore we were not able to explore these solutions. You're not asking to expect too much from the season. <laughs> <laughs> has to be that, perfect. Uh, this uh, has an inherent low scratch resistance, which it was probably have, right? Would this system be compatible with another system to, that would impart good scratch resistance? Well, as with you cannot put anything on top of it. Uh, it's possible. It, in industry, they currently do to uh, get the better scratch resistance. They deposit a thin layer of quartz that is like in the nanometer range. We do not know if this would help or if this would uh, increase reflectivity again because these are like this is done in industry and we do not, did not have access to that. Okay. Now, uh, a question that is more to the work that you actually uh, was able to. How did you control the thickness of the polymer layers? So once again, this was controlled by the pull speeds. So by changing the pull speed, where we deposit the mesopore silica, it would create different film thicknesses. Did you measure, like you did for the other one? Yeah, so the measurements were, were mainly based off of our optical results. As we mentioned, the maximum uh, transmission will occur at basically four times the wavelength of whatever the thickness is. So if we get a, so, So here, for example, if you look at the blue line, the maximum thickness is at about 400, or maximum transmission is about 450 nanometers. Therefore, we can infer this is a film thickness of about 110. Yes. Yes. So how about the So we didn't actually have a way. Of, so initially, we wanted to do SEM cross-sectional imaging, but we didn't have a way of precisely cutting our samples to get the sort of the cross-sectional view we were looking for. It's definitely something for future work. So yeah, the height of the. The polymer is based off of the black silicon master mold. We have this slide comparing the transmission and polymer, right? Of polymer and yeah, of what? The way you have dif different polymer systems. This, yeah. this one, or the one with the nano, uh, with the mesopore silica also. Yeah, the other one is preferable. Okay. Like that one. Yes. Yeah. So you you are able to you were able to measure the the mesoporous alone? Yes. Yes. You, you know a method for measure the polymer alone, the SEM, you didn't do but you know how to do it. Yes. And how you measure them together? So the measure of the thickness of the mesoporous silica alone was measured using DECTAC, where you could scratch the MPS layer and then measure the difference. However, if we were to scratch the nanostructures, it would both destroy the MPS and the nanostructures, so we don't really know at what point the DECTAC would start measuring at. So we infer this, the thickness of the films we created from the thickness of our films made on blank glass substrates. Okay, I have a question. So the, the UV curve or resin, so yes. what, what the wavelength of the UV light you were dealing with? 350 nanometers. But, uh, but like uh, the absorption uh, of your, like uh, the resin layers, you know, sort of visible already, right? So what type of... Uh, like the maximum absorption is at 350, but there was a wide sort of range of absorption wavelengths. So, if you use a better resin, you probably can get rid of it. Yeah, so we're expecting that if we move on to different uh, substrates, such as polycarbonate or PMMA, that this this transmission is actually probably pretty flat at between 96 and 90 percent across all visible wavelengths. This, this drop-off that you see in the low wavelengths is because it is a UV curable polymer.